Now, it's my pleasure to briefly introduce somebody I could spend quite a bit of time introducing, but I'll make it brief to give her time to talk to you tonight. We're very pleased to have back on campus Mary Matlin and James Carville. In February, they were here involved in a debate hosted by the Bush School of Government and Public Service. They must have enjoyed the experience because they're back again. And Ms. Matlin has specifically agreed to speak to you tonight as your convocation speaker. She has an extraordinary resume. I will not even attempt to read all of it, but a few things I'll mention. She served as an advisor to Presidents Reagan, George H.W. Bush, and George W. Bush. She is currently a political contributor for CNN and co-hosts the national radio show, Both Sides Now, with Arianna Huffington. In addition, she and her husband are co-chairman of the 2013 NFL Super Bowl host committee. They're also co-chairman of the Centennial Celebration for Loyola University of New Orleans, where she is a visiting distinguished lecturer. She also sits on the President's Council at Tulane University and on several boards beyond that. She and her husband have co-authored the best-selling book, All's Fair in Love, War, and Running for President. And she's also written a book called Letters to My Daughters for her daughters Maddie, 17, and Emma, 14. So she brings the perspective of someone who has walked with presidents, but been a mother, has been married to an interesting individual. <laughs> I won't say any more than that. And is ready to bring to you the insights of her vast experience and knowledge. Ms. Matlin, thank you for being here tonight. been called Boris, honey. <laughs> Howdy, Aggies. Howdy. Wow, you look so serious. Mr. President, Mr. Chancellor, Board of Regents, Dr. Watson, dear friends, Andy and Kathleen and Card and their Davisons for bringing us here. Podium celebrants, there's Andy and Kathleen. James and, and Jim, our dear friends, devoted husband. Uh, on behalf of all of us, it's an honor to congratulate the class of 2013. Go Aggies, congratulations, 2013, you're there. As, as the President said, James and I have been here many times. We, we do love it here, but joining your convocation strikes terror um, into my heart, even though it's a very special honor. It's, it's so very easy to, to detail and articulate what's so special about each and every one of you, but it's very terrifying to give a commencement speech because I can only see you through the eyes of a mother, as was mentioned. And as my daughters never tire of telling me, um, and they have, they're 14 and 17 now, but they've been doing it for almost a decade now, I am the world's biggest dork. By which they mean I lose it quite frequently whenever I commend any of their achievements. It's very easy um, to do that when for every parent, and what, what my girls don't understand, what you might un not understand is that Every young person's achievement is a moment of shock and awe for every parent <laughs> in more ways than one. And when you have kids, then every kid is your kid. So you'll see when you, you have your own kids. So today you are, you're all my children. You're all leaving home. This is the part where I crack up. You're all starting your own home. It's your day, it's your time, and through my uh, mother's eyes, I'm so proud of you. I'm equally terrified that I might not be able to convey to you some semblance of what this transition does mean to your, to your own parents. You know, of course, they're bursting with pride and they're humbled by your grit and your growth and your potential. And, whether or not you may know this completely, because it is impossible to put into words since the very moment 
of your conception from your first breath, you have been their constant object of vigilance, of unconditional love, and of unwavering faith, without which you wouldn't be here today about to don your Aggie ring. So what might, what might not be uh, further not evident to you is that this feeling that they're having today pales uh, in comparison to every hour since you do your first breath. You are a joy beyond description. I still sing to my teenage girls the song of their infancy. I'm not a good singer, but a, joy, 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 where down in my heart, where down in my heart, they see me coming, they're like, ah, stop it, down in the heart. Good. So I just want to tell you as you launch here that in your whole life, you'll never receive a greater blessing than knowing unconditionally no matter where you go, what path you take, where you've been, that you're the source of true and pure joy, that you are carried in your parents' heart. Always carry that in your heart. Your parents would never ask, and they don't expect to be thanked, thanked but if we could just take a moment and give your parents a, a thoughtful and prayerful applause, please, for your parents. Thank you. <laughs> when my daughter edited this last night, she was like, ah, you're such a dork, so. All right, it is your time. It's your time to seize the day. Your carpe diem will call on uh, all of your personal and collective generational resources. Your day is fraught with challenges. These are troubled times. Few generations are born to such tumultuous shifts and such uncertain future. Uh, uh, as you know, I hope you know, um, that today is the, the, maybe you haven't because you've been so, uh, I hope, wrapped up in, in celebrating your transition here, that this is the day of the release of the latest of the Hobbit adventures. And as I was thinking about your confronting your reality, I was putting mine of Frodo Baggins of the Shire when he first learns of his reality and says, I wish it need not have happened in my time. And like Gandalf, I must tell you, so do I, and so do all who live and see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. Like Frodo and his heroic friends, this time has been given to you for a purpose. You're the Rengen, you're the Renaissance generation. It falls to you to usher in a new but true way to go forward. It's an unimaginable opportunity. It's also a tremendous burden. But you're ready. You're equipped. As Tolkien teaches us through the unlikely hobbits, quote, even the smallest person can change the course of the future. But you aren't unlikely heroes. It is the mission of A&M today, as it has been for over the last half of our nation's history, the first half of our nation's history, to groom heroes, to groom leaders, dedicated to serving the greater good. You are special. You are special. You are an Aggie. You are the 21st century champions of freedom. You come from a long line of liberty lovers and charged with carrying on their work. You've been prepared by the best to do your best for the best. Yours is no small burden, and the country thanks you for taking it on. Let's, uh, if we could take a moment and reflect on these core values that have been referenced, your Aggie values. They, uh, they're the compass for your journey. It's hard to overstate how important it is to have this compass, and it, it has, it will not only, as has always been the case with Aggies graduates in the Aggie community, it will not just determine your destiny, but truly the future of this country. You've been inculcated with these values, excellence, integrity, leadership, loyalty, respect, selfless service. You've learned from and lived among those who epitomize these values, starting with the entire Bush family. I had intended to uh, 
suggest how each of these Aggie values could play out in your lives by sharing illustrations of the illustrations of them through the life of my hero, George Herbert Walker Bush, or as I call him, Poppy, who I understand now is bowling on we. That's his re he's, he's, he's never, the man never stops. He is, um, he is my hero. He's not just my hero, my personal. He's a hero for his time. He's a hero for all time. My girls grew up with, um, they grew up with, they call him Poppy too, Poppy Bush. And they, there was Poppy Bush before they were even a thought in my mind. So I asked them to tell me their favorite uh, Poppy hero story. And they both said, YOLO, jumping out of the sky. So that's, uh, he is, he's a, whatever YOLO is, they said you would know what that was. So I, it's, um, you only live once, honey, because that's how you've been living your life. That's how they get it. So um, that's their, that reach for the stars. That's what they take from the inspiration and the exemplar of the values that you've been inculcated with. Actually, in falling from the sky, I'm kind of with Mrs. Bush on that. No moss. No moss. So uh, closer to earth, though, Poppy is, uh, if I may call him that, he, he is an exemplar. He's a living exemplar of each of those values and more. I, was, uh, I could never do his virtuous, quietly heroic life justice, so I urge you, as I, I know you've read about him, and, but I urge you to study up on his times and his life and his leadership as our 41st president. But I'm cautioning you, you will not find the most astounding of his accomplishments and, and, and virtues in his memoirs because his number one virtue was humility. Poppy always put me in mind of my favorite 20th century philosopher, Dietrich von Hildebrand, whom I uh, hope you have studied or, or will study. Von Hildebrand wrote many a treatise on humility, humility being the wellspring of all virtues. Humility is in short supply these days, in your day. You live in an age of hubris, loud and harsh and certain opinions bombarding us all day, every day, a steady stream of superfluous thought, boastful, angry, arrogant, and completely irrelevant. My husband always makes me laugh with his description of a particular vanity for which we share an aversion. Those who can never leave any thought unspoken. Um, there are a few contemporary examples of Poppy's humility. That's why I, 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 I do like to focus on him and, and how I have asked my own children to focus on him of what is good and virtuous and right and how, we, how they need to go forward, not in their own lives, but again for our future. When I think of what uh, the blabbermouthing that my husband and I participate in, I hope we're somewhat contemplative, but I, I just put in mind of Poppy having to defend his humble personhood. So every, you know his history, you know all of his accomplishments, and he would had to defend his lack of bragging about himself by saying, quote, I have opinions of my own, strong opinions, but I don't always agree with them. Do you see such humility? Have you seen such sentiments on the front page of the paper or on television or on blogs or tweets or wherever you look? No, quite the opposite. Today's standard is often in error, never in doubt. You know the type. That is so not you. It's anathema here at a and Your panoply of Aggie virtues and values always starts with and ends with humility. It's the hallmark of great leaders who all know, as you know, when pride comes, then comes dishonor, but with the humble is wisdom. I'll tell you a true story of how this poppy's President Bush, the former leader of the free world's humility plays out in real life. Few have accomplished as much as he has or certainly I don't really know anybody who's remained as humble as he in the face of all that he's accomplished. So the, this, the wisdom and the humility of, of his whole being is always present. We were on the, we were losing in 1992, the 92 campaign, if you remember this. I call it the recent unpleasantness still. And I was the, the body man 
And he was not feeling well. He did have then, he had pneumonia, he was fevered, he was uh, gray. Andy's uh, brother-in-law was on the, and I were on the plane together. That everybody was quarantined. And uh, President Bush insisted on, at the end of the campaign, we were on a train trip. We, he insisted on doing six events a day. Perseverance, fortitude. And as sick as he was, it was on this train trip, it was raining. If any, I'm from the Midwest. The Midwest can get really cold and ugly at that time of year and just bone chilling. And he was so sick. And he did all these events every day. And he would just come back and collapse. And he, would be, he was so tired and sick and kept pushing himself. And my job was to have him stay on message. And he would go out there and talk to the Clinton Nista sent a giant chicken after us, a chicken in debate or whatever it was. So he'd always come on and go, hey, where's Mr. Chicken? I'm not going to talk till the chicken's here. So my friends from DC come and said, quit talking about the chicken. Stay on message. I said, you've got too much going on here. He doesn't feel well. It's your job to take care of him because I'm devoted to him. So we, we're leaving on this train after six events. He's sick as a dog. I find him sitting in the open air caboose. Uh, in the rain, just looking down the tracks. I said, what are you doing, sir? He said, well, I'm, every couple miles, there are, there are people on the route, on the train tracks. I'm like, okay, we're behind, but you know, we don't need voters that bad. Get back in here, get out of the cold. He said, it's not about votes, it's not about politics. It's about the presidency of the United States. It's about duty, honor, country. It's about, these people are not coming out to see me. They're coming out to see their president, their president of these United States. I said, okay, then I'm going to just stay out here with you. We're all going to get sick. And I figured I'd wear him down. He goes, look, look, there's a family right there. And sure enough, you could see from the silhouettes in the distance was an entire family, a mother, a father, a sister and brother. As we drew near, we saw that that entire family uh, was mooning the president of the United States. Um, so I, uh, <laughs> I was aghast. And he, he, this is Poppy Bush. He just was cracking up. He said he loved it. He said, this is great. This is what America is all about. I said, what about the golden rule? He said, I'd rather turn the other cheek. I'm like, oh, let's stop this conversation. <laughs> So the kicker of this is the next day, he gets up and instead of in his six speeches and he's still not feeling well, instead of talking, looking for the chicken, he goes, guess what happened to me last night? I'm like, oh. So Andy, who was my boss at the time, said, please, Mary, get, get it under control. So I just want to say, no matter how high his, the heights, all his accomplishments, all he's left, um, he really is the e exemplar and the ever-present uh, for you here to strive to for strive for excellence and start with humility. If if the fountainhead of uh, all virtues is humility, the bedrock of of all uh, excellence is of every endeavor is excellence. And I'm going to tell you something. I tell my own kids: excellence is in all things is little more than work. There's nothing that you can't do. When I tell my girls that, they say, oh, you're just my mother. No, this is experience. I think it was mentioned that James and I, the co-chairman of the 20, it was 47th, 2013 Super Bowl, and yesterday we had a big giant meeting and the, the uh, fellow host committee member, Rod uh, West, whom you may know if you're in the energy business, who's our CEO of Entergy in Louisiana, uh, was in charge of all the community service. And he started detailing this mammoth Saturday of service day that he's put together. I'm you, he's a CEO of Entergy. He has a 17-year-old, his daughter and our daughter are classmates. He's, good in, he's sending her off to college. So much going on. I simply could not. Everybody was just blown away by what he had managed to do with all of his other responsibilities. And he, he, I, we said, well, how do you even do this? And he goes, I'm going to just tell you, he's, just tell you this. he's from Notre Dame, and he was the, a fighting Irish, and he just quoted his coach saying, success comes before work in only one place in the dictionary. Now, his coach is probably quoting somebody else, but I don't need the fighting Irish or not the example of only this, more about the uh, fighting Aggies in a moment. But 
excellence is a product of work and, and application, and it is as important as humility. I bring this up because you do have and have long had this inter intergenerational, as the president mentioned, Aggie burden of leadership. And if you Google leadership, you will get 507 million hits or descriptions. And every single one of them contain the values that you've already obtained, that you've already been inculcated with. So you're, you're a, a jump ahead. The selfless service one, is, as I was just referencing it with uh, uh, Rod West, is a, is, is a signature of the Bush family who, in, who have been their whole lives devoted to service, public and community service, duty, honor, country. It is the North Star of Texas A&M. Those of us who were privileged to work with President Bush saw other Aggie virtues play out all the time. Here's a couple of my favorites rolled into one just to show you how they play out in real life because these are not the legends of books. They're just daily living and how you apply these values. Starting with integrity, J.K. Rowling wrote of integrity. If you want to know what a man's like, take a look at how he treats his inferiors, not his equals. Poppy's respect and loyalty regardless of station for everybody was a legendary. And his loyalty to me knew no bounds, more than magnificent because of my unworthiness. He would always stand up for me when I, whether I deserved it or not, and I frequently didn't, starting with his, the, his first run for president. He had won, as you know his history, the 1980 Iowa caucuses, so when he was in the 1988 Iowa uh, straw ballot and primaries, there was, of course, a universal uh, expectation that he would win those, that, those, um, those straw ballot, that straw ballot contest, which is meaningless. It was evident to me when they sent me there, I lived in, in Iowa for months and months and months to work on this meaningless event, and it was clear to me this is a combination of the other candidates in there, not least being Senator Dole, who was a next door neighbor there, but we were not going to win. And I told DC, I told the campaign headquarters, we weren't going to win. I assumed that they had told the president, you know, they have taught you about assuming. When we did lose that night, um, clearly everyone was in shock, starting with uh, the vice president, then vice president and, and Mrs. Bush in the, I got fired on the spot. I went back to my hotel room. Lee Atwater, who was the, the, uh, my boss then, and the late great Lee Atwater had ran that campaign, fired me on the spot, called me at my hotel, fired me again, woke me up in the middle of the night with the, my, all of my colleagues, my regional political directors, fired me a third time. I said, okay, I got it. I'm fired. I know. Did you, and I, you weren't allowed to whine and say I told you anything, and I, and I didn't, but I, I still remember that, that awful night, because I loved Poppy so much, and this was not the way to kick off his campaign, and it was a lumpy bed in a smelly hotel, and a frozen burrito from 7-Eleven in the microwave for dinner. It was just the worst night, and at the crack of dawn, the phone rang again. I said, this is sadistic. So he pecked at the phone and said, I'm fired! And Poppy Bush is on the other line. On the other end, he goes, where are you? We're leaving. We're going to Wisconsin. We need to go to Wisconsin. I said, I've been fired. He goes, oh, you're on fire. He on fired me. He goes, but don't let Lee Atwater see you. <laughs> you remember that? He just, so this is, I could tell you a million stories. Uh, I'm not a million, because I really, I guess I am a loser. Since they, most of these stories are an account of Poppy unfiring me. And I want to tell you how. He, he always takes the extra step. And these are ostensibly random acts of kindness, but these are the, this is a, a, a gift that you can take with you that all your Aggie brethren share. After another time that I got fired and it just happened, it doesn't matter what I did, it was when I did it. I happened to have committed this infraction on a day that was our first good day in 1992 when we were otherwise getting creamed by these people over here. So it was our first good day. We were on message, and whatever I did exploded into this meltdown. Everybody again was calling me for to be fired, including the pundits and the network news, and I was 
packed up my stuff and fully expected, deserved, deserved, asked to be fired. And I picked up, I was packed up and I picked up the phone and it was President Bush from Air Force One saying, where do you think you're going? You're not, you're not going anywhere. And I'm <laughs> weeping, weeping, weeping. He goes, that a girl, that a girl, that a girl, just keep fighting. Lower your decibel a little bit. Just lower your decibel a little bit. Fight, fight, fight. Loyal, loyal, loyal. But here's the kicker to that story. So we used, we had uh, once a week or so at, not in the campaign headquarters, but the campaign would come to the White House and meet in the cabinet room, the, the, uh, rather the Roosevelt room, and the president never came to these things. They were, they were staff meetings. And he made an appearance, and the campaign rightly and the White House rightly were very angry with me. I'd stepped all over a message. And I knew, I mean, I think they thought he was coming in to fire me. And he walked around the table, this presence that was never there, never expected to be there, and put his arms, like, put his hands on my shoulders and said, you know, Mary, I really love you for loving my dog so much, but Barbara says you had to quit feeding Millie bagels as he slipped down under my feet. The dogs were always under my feet because I was slipping a bagel, as he slipped them a bagel. He didn't say anything about the incident. He just made it clear to everybody that loyalty is, loyalty is a, very, a very special thing that needs to be reinforced and, and, and stated all the time. And I'll, I, he, I'll never, ever, ever be able to thank him. And I hope that you have someone in your life or an experience like that or are able to give that gift to somebody. So you are, these, all of these values, you are charged with uh, passing them on as they were passed to you through tr tradition and time and heritage. There's some additional values that um, aren't, don't hang from your lamppost, but they're critical time-tested elements and templates of the good society, prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. The reason I bring them up is because your generation's good society is in uncharted territory you are the ones, you are the generation that, that is going to have to apply these time-honored values to this era of unprecedented technologies, which are more, they're just tools, but they're accessible for good or evil. We live in an era of uh, the threat, the danger of our technologies outstripping our wisdom. We, as a nation, collectively confronted this existential threat of our day in a clear September morning over a decade ago. Ancient atrocities activated on innocence were mobilized and magnified by modern technologies. What were, in another age, uh, horrific but localized acts of terror presented themselves uh, in our age as global barbarity. These tools of progress became instruments of evil. It's your charge to corral these technologies and deploy them with prudence with what Aristotle defined as recta ratio and agabilium, the right reason applied to practice. Do not confuse evil with goodness, means with ends. Dispatch your charge with temperance, which as Aquinas taught us requires balancing legitimate goods against our inordinate desire for them. Goods and tools that we could use to make quantum leaps in progress could have disastrous physical and moral consequences if subjected to disordered uses. So for all these values and more in your leadership burden, which is unique and unprecedented, you'll need fortitude. Looking to our friend Frodo again, who said, I know what I must do, I'm just afraid to do it. Fortitude gives you the strength to overcome fear and stay your steady course. James and I tell our girls all the time, I'm certain it's something your parents tell you all the time, the only people who don't fail are those who never try. Stand up, overcome your fear. If you prefer cowboys to hobbits, John Wayne said, courage is being scared to death, but saddling up anyway. My husband and I are devoted to message discipline, so I repeat, as an Aggie, a chosen leader, are secure and prosperous future depend on you and your well-chosen universal application of these time-honored values. 
One final thing before you launch, remember why you are called to lead the true and pure destination of your journey. On this point, I'm gonna quote Barbara Bush, who literally changed my life with a concluding comment in her commencement speech to Wellesley grads over three decades ago. Quote, at the end of your life, you will never regret not having passed one more test, winning one more verdict, or not closing one more deal. You will regret time not spent with a husband, a child, a friend, or a parent. In the parlance of the hobbits, uh, remember the Shire. I had willingly left my own Shire from the Midwest, and I was hurtling through life, speeding through life. I was at the top of my game, the pinnacle of my career, uh, and she stopped me cold in my tracks with that. I mean, I wasn't even at the event. I just had a copy of her speech. It stopped me, not only stopped me cold, cold in my tracks, changed the trajectory of my life and led me to the blessed life that I have today for which I had not even remotely imagined, yet alone planned. Which leads me to this unorthodox conclusion to my remarks, which reflect a mother's heart. I want to leave you with a father's inspiration. I didn't really clear this. Um, one of my organizing principles, for better or for worse, is to beg forgiveness rather than ask for permission. So forgive me for sharing, without permission, the source of my daily inspiration. Hopefully, a graduate of LSU can be an inspiration to you. Frankly, it should be an inspiration to you. It took him 11 years to get out of there. The man Barbara Bush used to call he who shall not be named, James Carville. I, uh, thank you. I remember my graduation day at LSU. I actually had a 4.0 on graduation day. It was my blood alcohol level. I, <laughs> what a great talk uh, and uh, what an inspiring story in, in, in President Bush. And uh, the, the story I just want to tell you a very quick story. And it so happens that every word of this story is true, which is unusual for me. <laughs> uh, I, I do some work around the world with a retired CIA agent, and we were back in Bogota this weekend, and we're having dinner, and he's a, a very nice guy, and kind of soft-spoken, and he, he said, uh, you know uh, President George H.W. Bush? And I said, yeah, I'm, yeah, I know him, I've met him any number of times. He says, uh, is he a good guy? I said, yeah, he's a great guy. He said, yeah, I, I like him. I said, good. He said, you know, in, in 1989, I was at the embassy in Paris, and Andy called him, Mary, or anybody can tell you that CIA agents work out of the embassy. And it was the 200th anniversary of the French Revolution. And President Bush came to the embassy in Paris. And the ambassador got everybody together, and, and it was, you know, great. You can imagine what Paris was like in the summer of 1989, 200th anniversary, every world leader was there. The American embassy in Paris is just a stunning place, honey. It's right by the Hotel Creole, the Place de la Concorde. And he said, well, you know, he was laughing about what a great gig they had there. And he said, you know, I was thinking about staying a couple extra days in Paris here with the ambassador at the embassy, such a nice place. He said, but I'm going to the Netherlands. And so he concluded his speech, and so the ambassador stands up and he says, uh, if anybody has any questions, the president's graciously said that he would entertain a couple of questions. And so everybody is thinking the same thing. And so one guy stands up and said, Mr. President, because everybody's saying, why is he going to the Netherlands? I mean, what a, you know, here you are in France and the president of the United States and it's a little, little country. And so he says, well, Mr. President, you're leaving here. Why are you going to the Netherlands? He said, you know, the first country to recognize the United States of America was Holland. The Dutch were the first people. We are a country, and no one paid any attention to us. They sent their first ambassador. John Adams was our ambassador in the Netherlands. And every time that the United States has ever done something, the Dutch have always been with us. And I thought because, and no president has ever gone. And I thought because I was in the neighborhood, I'd go over and thank them. This is what I want to tell you. You're going to go far in life. You're going to be research professors, energy moguls, doctors, 
whatever it is, whatever you choose to do, you got a tremendous education. And when you get to the top, when you get to that pinnacle, you think back, now who is my Holland? Who is a person that helped me? When I was at A&M, or I was somewhere, if I was back in high school, who was it that stood with me? Maybe I'm bigger than they are today. Maybe I'm more successful than they are. But do President Bush a favor. Go back and pay him a visit. Thank him. They're sick, go see him. If something like that. That's a real value. That's real loyalty. That's what exists. Even if it's all that time ago, somebody was the first to recognize you. Somebody stood with you for a long time. And it matters not how big they are, but how loyal they are. So I, Mary, I just what a terrific talk you gave. I'm so proud of this, I'm so proud of this woman. If you, you have anything that I hope for you, that you marry a spouse like I did. But I gotta tell you, uh, I got a little bone to pick here. First of all, uh, I'm delighted to have you in the SEC, and uh, it's too bad that Texas University plays in the third-rate conference and you play in the first-rate conference, <laughs> but that's what happens. But I, I just want to say one thing. I'm not happy. Let me get this straight. We've been in the SEC since 1933, and you've been in it since 2012, and we beat you at home, and you go to a better game, better bowl game than we do. That's not fair. See you in Baton Rouge. Two for the price of one. <laughs> not bad. Th thank you both. Uh, President Bush 41, I can't call him Poppy. I can't do that. Uh, is very special Texas A&M. Uh, he chose this place for his library, uh, not because he had been a student here at all. Uh, in fact, he had rarely been to Texas A&M. But he told us all that he shared the values of Texas A&M. And that was why his library is here. And you've woven very nicely in your remarks there some things about President Bush that we're all very proud of. So I thank you for that. I thank you for bringing in the topic of leadership, which we find very special. Something A&M is very, very involved in doing with all of you here tonight. So we thank you again. Let's thank our speakers again. So I hope you remember tonight, going forward, I will see each of you either tomorrow or Saturday. There are about 3,700 of you graduating. It's a cakewalk compared to me. <laughs> I'll do my best to call you by name. Uh, you have about three seconds as you come towards me on the stage, and I'll be watching you, looking for the emotions that you're feeling at that moment. It keeps me going through that, those events. Being an Aggie, though, is something that you'll be all your life. It's a lifelong commitment. And we want you to continue your engagement with Texas A&M. So while you're here tonight, tomorrow, or Saturday, please visit the Clayton W. Williams Jr. Alumni Center. You'll have a chance to get your picture taken by a professional at the Hayes Ring Plaza. Uh, not many places offer a 6,000 pound version of this ring. And begin the next tradition by being a part of our association of former students. No doubt, the best, the most successful alumni organization in the world. So I wish you all well. I will see you tomorrow, Saturday, and now I ask Mr. Kipp to come back up here and lead us in singing The Spirit of Aggieland. Please rise. <clears throat> Some may boast a prowess bold, 
of the school they think so grand but there's a spirit can ne'er be told it's the spirit of Aguilar we are the Aggies the Aggies are we true to each other as Aggies can be we've got to fight boys we've got to fight We've got to fight for maroon and white. How do they boost at all the rest? Then they will come and join the best. For we are the Aggies, the Aggies are we. We're from Texas AMC. This concludes our ceremony. Have a safe and pleasant evening with your families. See you tomorrow or Saturday.